Hello, everyone. I hope you all are having an amazing day, and I would like to let you know on this amazing day that I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Matthew Donald. There you can find bonus content for both my shows, The Rit, Wit, and Paleobites. For The Paleobites bonus content, we discuss pop culture featuring prehistoric animals, and this month we're talking about... Let's see, what are they say we're talking about this week? Let me just look at the... Let me look at the list here. Uh, Megazoic! My own book series! Wow, I must have really run out of ideas. That's not true. We got plenty of other dinosaur pop culture to talk about, but I thought this time we'd do something a little different. And don't worry, it's not me reviewing my own book. That would be biased and unprofessional. Of course not. No, I've got two other people to do it. People who are very unbiased and are willing to give their professional opinion on my book series. So, <laughs> yeah, it's great. We all have a good time. Link is in the description before you can sign up to the Patreon. Thank you for your support and have a lovely day. Ugh. Having people pay to listen to review, that is an ad for my own work to make people pay for that. Capitalism, baby! Roar. Growl. Snarl. Bellow. Welcome to Paleobites, the podcast that spans 4.6 billion years. All that first 4 billion years is pretty boring, so not really that. <laughs> uh, my name is Matthew Dahl, and each week I'm a rotating series of guest co-hosts talk about and rate a genius of prehistoric animal, be it dinosaur, mammal, arthropod, and so on. This week I'm joined by someone who is so ready to talk about today's creature that he's fervently looking through his book with his finger on it to see, what, where is it? What are we talking about? Where is it? It's Stephen Carl! How are you? Hello, I'm doing good. Yes, I apologize. I thought I had the right page. That's I okay. Archaeo Indris. It's on the description of the episode if you're paying attention. Okay, here it is. Okay, Windows. Ha, okay, okay, cool. What um, page is this? Page wow. 87. For 87. The okay. In my Princeton Field Guide to Prehistoric Mammals. Oh, nice, nice. Of course. Okay, 87. Okay, that's my dinosaur related question. If you had to bring back 87 <laughs> of the same individual dinosaur just to have in your possession or to. <laughs> which one? <laughs> 87. Oh, my word. 101 Dalmatians, 87, whatever. <laughs> uh, I feel like if I had 87. Um, Archaeopteryxes, they'd yeah, be flying around in a little. Get that little nice aviary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Although well, we don't really know if Archaeopteryx really flew. It just kind of like maybe a microraptor. Yeah, microraptor. I don't know. Yeah, some of those like glided. I don't know. Maybe it flew a little. I don't know. They could climb. They could definitely climb. Put them in aviary. Very arboreal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that could be cool. I am going to do eighty-seven T Rexes. <laughs> just too many. Just for the chaos. <laughs> just for the chaos, and then, <laughs> and that way also like maybe I can sell them, and I'm like I'm sure. According to Fallen Kingdom, which okay. these were underpriced anyways, people want to use a dinosaur for like $10 million? <laughs> like, wow. Something like that. So the 87, that's $870 million. <laughs> so, oh, dear. You've got, you've got the green-eyed monster there. Well, I guess it's true. And then, well, I guess who am I selling it to? You know, Russian... Ugly arcs. Ugly arcs. That's what I'm looking for. Russian yeah, ugly yeah. arcs, you know. Yeah. Warlords from yep, yep. De- Africa. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What are they Korean. going to do? Like, if you're if you're a warlord and you're buying a dinosaur, are you trying to be like Doctor Evil, where you feed people to the dinosaur, push the button, and your chair falls down? Oh, like a rancor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I think the country that would love to have a dinosaur and probably could use it the well is North Korea, <laughs> because they don't really have the technology to like do anything to. Like, because they try to, man, they try to fire those missiles and they just can't quite they just do can't. it. No, no. Not so, quite. but if they had a t- <laughs> they had a T Rex, <laughs> they could threaten people with that. <laughs> they could use it for all sorts of state propaganda, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. It's just like if you don't salute to Kim Jong Un or whoever is the person now, we'll send the T Rex after you. <laughs> and oh look, there's eighty six others. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, South Korea is watching. Like, what is happening over there? Just quick, just quick, get some ankylosaurus fast. <laughs> That's what South Korea is saying. <laughs> so, anyway. actually, fun thing about North Korea. Yes. Um, oh yeah. Okay. That's always a fun way to start a conversation. Well, fun thing about North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> From a paleontological point of view, oh. um, um, we don't know what's in there. Oh, like, because no one. Yeah, I've heard. Like, I, I attended the Western Tier Paleontological Society. They're you know paleontology 101, and the teacher said, "Yeah, like we have no idea what's in there geologically because no one's been able to go." Do we even it. know like what's close to it? I guess like I mean they can they can look near China and South Korea. and yeah. get, a, get an, a rough but, idea of age and stuff. Because there also could be a chance there's nothing there. Like, because it's all eroded. That's like, true. There's always a chance. But, I mean, like, you know, paleontologists have been itching to get in there and see what we can find. That's true. Like, <laughs> imagine we finally liberate the people of North Korea. Paleontologists come in, it's like, yeah, we get to dig here. And the people are like, yeah, we're safe. Like, yeah, yes, that too. <laughs> 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 we're just 
<laughs> We're just really excited. We want to play with your rocks. <laughs> yes, basically. Uh. Anyhow. Anyway, so, uh, speaking of uh, none of that, uh, as per <laughs> usual, uh, we're talking about a creature that you brought to my attention. I did not know this creature existed. That's why I like doing this show. I get to learn stuff, too. Yay! So, we're talking about Archeo Indris, the ancient Indris lemur. Indris is a group of lemurs. Kind yes. Of, kind of closely related to the Safakas, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we'll talk more about that here. Uh, anyway. Indries, for those who don't know, are the largest living uh, lemurs. Yes. Yes, they are the largest living lemurs, about the size of, of a gibbon, I guess, or like, or just a size. Give or take. Yeah, like, like you can, it can still, like, sit on your shoulder pretty comfortably. Like. Yeah, they're still relatively small. But, you know, they're, they're big for mm-hmm. a lemur. Yeah, exactly. But this one, this one, oh my goodness. Okay, so type is a paleopropithecid, a family of extinct lemurs, also known as sloth lemurs. Which is kind of cute. Kristen Bell would love it. <laughs> uh, size five to six feet slash one point five to one point eight meters tall. Uh, Three hundred and fifty to five hundred and thirty pounds. One hundred and sixty to two hundred and forty-four kilograms. Uh-huh. Big boy. Big. Uh, diet herbivore, thankfully though. <laughs> uh, although maybe it dialed it a few bugs, but probably not. I talk more about what it eats down here. Uh, time mid Pleistocene to early Holocene. 1.5 million to 2,300 years ago. That is pretty damn recent. Yep. Like that. I mean, to be fair, Madagascar was pretty uninhabited for a while. For a long time. And in fact, uh, the, the people that first inhabited Madagascar weren't Africans. They were Polynesians. Right, right. Which is so. weird. I guess like, I guess the people of Africa didn't really have any need to go ocean faring. Were they Polynesian or Melanesian? Or some, somewhere in Southeast Asia. Right. So there's just someone from Southeast Asia that were just like... What's this way? Let's sail in this direction. Oh, here's this island with these crazy, strange primate creatures. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Let's what's a little bit beyond beyond. Oh, it's Africa. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> stop. But yeah, I guess the the African people they had no need really to to sail to that because like we got everything on this big continent. <laughs> yeah, they didn't seem particularly interested in just mm-hmm. tra- braving the ocean. Yeah, and then again, they have a whole huge continent. They didn't really need to. <laughs> So, location, as we said, Madagascar. Described in 1909. Pop culture appearances, I could not find any, which, may I say, is a damn shame. It has no. Like, um... Like, not even in Jurassic World, the game, which has all these other creatures. Which is unfortunate. Yeah. I, I, the only reason I know this animal existed is because I was looking up lemurs in general and mm-hmm. what's the biggest lemur. And then I, st- uh, you know, I'm scrolling on Wikipedia. There's mm-hmm. that page where they talk about the extinct lemurs. And, um... You know, I read that there were prehistoric lemurs that used to be the size of gorillas I'm but like, once upon a time. It's yeah. like, what? It's like, what? <laughs> the part of me that makes me weird for me to imagine is like, it's, I, when I imagine big primates, I imagine like apes, which means no tails. So what was this thing doing with its tail? I suppose just dragging. I'm, a, I'm not sure if this one in particular had a tail. Well, I mean, it's a lemur. They all had tails. Well, I guess I it may, may have had a shorter tail. Uh, like, hold on. Yeah, okay. Like, Where's yeah, I imagine it's not very long because they don't need it for like balance on trees anymore, so... This is the archaeo... Oh, that's the one I've seen on Wikipedia, too, that does picture. does not have a tail. No. Oh, well, it has a little bitty stub there, I guess. I mean, it's kind of like a bear a tail. It's like, not the kind that you'd use to, like, climb in trees. Yeah, like it's not like a long, like, lemur tail, you know, with the rings on it, so... Yeah, <laughs> So, yeah. But still, it's kind of interesting. Um, but, yeah, so... Lemurs are interesting. Uh, granted, they weren't what Disney's dinosaur told you and back in dinosaur times. No. I'm still fairly convinced that was just an executive being like, well, dinosaurs aren't relatable. Throw something cute and cuddly in yeah, there. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, lemurs, they're fascinating because they only occur on Madagascar. They do. They but... used to be, long, long time ago, I think there were some lemurs or um, pro prosimians, they call them, yeah. in mainland Africa, which have long since gone extinct. Right. And they've diversified into all sorts of creatures. Some of them look Kind of like monkeys. Some of them look like squirrels. Some of them look like mice. They're I know, literally like, a mouse lemur. They, they, I've seen <laughs> it too. Like, and yeah, their eyes are usually facing forward. So sometimes their snouts are really long. Like sometimes, mm. like that. I just love that in dinosaur. Like they make a big deal about explaining the carnotaurs. Like they never come this far north. Like what about these damn lemurs? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, where the hell do they get here? Like, <laughs> they sailed across the ocean. Yeah, but yeah. quite a long way. <laughs> Very long. <laughs> quite a long way. Not to mention I mean, back in time, but that's another. Story. I mean, I guess to be fair, like they could have, you know, back. Then, I mean, if we're gonna make it realistic here, <laughs> so the Tethy Sea was still a thing. So they didn't have to go all the way down the Horn of Africa. Like they could go through the Tethy Sea. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> That's how I explain it. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe there was just a time rift or something. Yeah, yeah that's that, why there's a population of lemurs on that one island. <laughs> that's true. Well, they're also in the nesting grounds too. Remember that one guy finds a bunch of them. Oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> so they're everywhere. <laughs> Maybe they're not lemurs. Maybe they're uh, purgatorious that happen to look exactly like lemurs. <laughs> but anyways. So uh, Archaeoindus is, like I said, the largest of extinct group of primates known as the sloth lemurs. Called such because of their remarkably similar postcranial structures to sloths. Uh, which is an interesting case of convergent evolution. Uh, while most of these sloths lemurs were mixed feeders, changing their diets based on seasonal availability, the largest ones, like Archaeoindus, were almost entirely folivorous. Or uh, specialized in browsing leaves. Mm. Like, folivory. I love those more specific words for an animal's diet. I've learned something today. Yeah, like, Fo- folivo- folivores. If I can pronounce it, folivorous. Folivores, yeah, folivorous. Folivorous. Okay. Like, fol- yeah. foliage. Is what it comes. Oh, that makes more sense. Foliage. Okay. So, foliv- folivores, frugivores, okay. eating fruit, uh, piscivores. There's also a thing called xylophores. I know there's an insectivore. Well, yeah. What do you, what do you think that eats? <laughs> mm. <laughs> xylophores eat wood, by the way. Because, like, a xylophone, I guess, is a wooden... Oh, okay. <laughs> so, sure, yeah. why not? <laughs> yeah. Termites, the famous xylophores, <laughs> I guess. Uh, anyways, there's, there's a lot of them, though. Uh, but nature has just so many different ways to sustain itself, which is pretty cool. Uh, but, yeah, the thing about leaves is that they're pretty they're pretty low on nutrients. That's why like, you don't really see a lot of birds that so, are eating, well, at least flying birds so that eat to, leaves. You have to eat a lot of them to get anything. The most the herbivorous birds that exist that fly tend to be frugivores because mm-hmm. all the sugar, you know, lets them have energy to fly. So right, right. You, you have a leaf eating. I mean, that's one of the reasons why pandas and like koalas are just so slow. <laughs> I think giraffes eat leaves. That's true. And you use that long tongue. <laughs> yes, to get, the, to get around the, the, the tongue is thick because there are thorns on the tree. Yeah. So, yeah, so I don't know. It's like, yeah, they eat leaves. I mean, there's also there's a whole thing called browsers, right? So, yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like uh, uh, giraffes would eat fruit. Like, I think in the zoos they give them some fruit, right? I'm sure they wouldn't turn like it out. Ch- chopped down, chopped up fruit. Probably because, like, in the wild, you know, they, uh, sort of like how with my cockatiel, like, in the wild, cockatiels and they'll eat seeds pretty much exclusively, hmm. but you don't want to give them that as a pet because they just sit around when they're a pet. And seeds are highly caloric, but normally in the wild they burn it off by flying everywhere. Uh, so that's good. To but know. in your cage they just sit there and they kind of play. Of course you want to give them some exercise, like move them around. But they don't like fly for miles and miles. So, so they'll gain weight. Yes, they'll gain weight. Yeah, they'll gain a lot of weight and that could be dangerous for them. So you want to give them like pellets or like other sort of nutritious stuff, vegetables. My bird hates vegetables. Though. <laughs> I try to give them to her. It's like eat your vegetables. She won't do it. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a dinosaur ridge. We had a turtle for a while. Oh yeah. And, uh, don't turtles eat fish? Red, they eat plants too, turtles. I guess. Yeah, some of them. Some of them I actually thought they ate pizza, but what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> this turtle eats ve- ate vegetables and stuff, but particularly loves strawberries. Oh, yeah. Oh, another thing I've heard that they yeah, love strawberries. Yeah, And you have to put the food on top for this particular species, red stripe, I forget. Yeah. You have to put it, like, on a rock so it can come up and then eat it underwater. Oh, okay. And the, the people who previously owned it gave it nothing but strawberries. Yeah. So it's like, okay, now you have to have a proper diet. You can't eat junk food all the time. Right. You know, no, I get that. Strawberries. Yeah, that, that's it. a very sweet, romantic food. Mm-hmm. A little bit more of a side tangent here real quick. But I just thought it was a funny story. So this one guy I work with, <laughs> one guy I work with, he is, uh, he's young and he's like so sweet. Like, I love him. Like, he's so friendly. But man, sometimes he's just like, oh my God, I love that person. Or, oh my God, that's so nice. Oh, I love that. You're so good. And then so when Valentine's Day was coming, around you know he he has a boyfriend and i was asking what you and your boyfriend are gonna do it's like oh we're making chocolate strawberries like shut up (laughs) that's the most sickingly sweet (laughs) it's the most romantic sweet and the most romantic fruit like just just a fruit that literally looks like a heart (laughs) remember making chocolate strawberries (laughs) shut up (laughs) no it's great (laughs) they had a good time (laughs) but i'm just like it was i thought that was very funny so what else have you found? Yeah, anyways, about archaeo interest. About archaeo interest. <laughs> we probably would enjoy the chocolate strawberries, but the chocolate would be bad for him. <laughs> yeah, no. Strawberries might be okay. So they have the Indris family includes the modern-day Indri, Safika, and Woolly Lemurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of Woolly, uh, archaeo Indris lived smack dab in the middle of the Ice Age, but surprisingly, it lived quite a bit beyond it as well, as we mentioned earlier. In fact, evidence suggests it lived to 2,300 years ago, 300 B.C., for instance, since the famous Battle of Thermopylae, the conflict between the Spartans and the Persians, <laughs> that the movie 300 is based on, that took place in 480 BC. That means that when Leonidas and his Spartans <laughs> were fighting the Persians, Archaeologists were still roaming the earth. 
that's, you know, when you put it in those terms, it's pretty wild to think about. Like, imagine that in the movie. Like, that movie's so stylized. That includes, like, blade-handed yeah. executioners, goat men, battle rhinos. Imagine if you just had an Arcu Indrus. Just <laughs> That would have been funny. I don't... I honestly, I'm not particularly fond of that movie because there, it's too. It's very, very stylized. It's very violent. Stylized. It's very violently like, kind of like the yeah, Spartans are cool when those like they also killed the babies because <laughs> they uh, had like a lot of eugenics. But if you had a battle art, he and yeah, just like again, like he Xerxes, like darkest corners of his empire, all these different creatures. Like imagine a Spartan fighting a, a giant sloth lemur. <laughs> I never realized it until now, but I always dreamed of that. <laughs> of watching that. So. Exactly. <laughs> Anyways. But yeah, no, that movie is definitely very divisive. As, as most of Zack Snyder's movies. I like that owl movie, though. Owl? You, you large into the Guardians, the Owls of Cahoon. Oh, I never saw that. Uh, it's all right. Six out of ten. Fun fantasy, though. Very pretty. You talk, yeah, it looks dazzling. Keep talking <laughs> owls, I mean. Yeah, exactly. Sam Neill's in it. So. Oh, well, now I have to see it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Speaking of humans, though, obviously when humans first arrived on Madagascar, it was bad news for them, as it usually is for any creature that comes in contact with those dirty humans. But uh, thankfully this time it wasn't entirely humans' fault either. Really? It, it was so big that uh, it could only have a select few places on Madagascar with a pro- proper amount of foliage and food for its folivorous diet. So it was already pretty rare when humans mm. first arrived there. But their overhunting and destruction of its habitat was the straw that broke the sloth lemur's back. So, Darn it. So sometimes I wonder why I do a show about prehistoric animals. <laughs> I was like, maybe I need a one million year cutoff point. Because <laughs> like, that was just get depressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I know this show will really go on under the deep end when like, if it's going on for 20 years... And like this went extinct ten years ago. That's right. Hopefully <laughs> Paleo <not>. bites. <laughs> when this show started, this creature was still around. Hopefully, we don't get that far. Ugh. Ugh. That'd be horrifying. Yeah, well, we're already in a place in time where, like, I think the most amount of species are dying per per year. It's comparable to the Permian extinction. <laughs> well, yeah, we're in the six. We are in the sixth extinction. Like they've, yeah. they've declared it. Yeah, uh, six mass so, extinction, which is unfortunate. Entirely but, anthropogenic, you know, in basis. But the fact, but the fact is, life has rebounded five times before. Yes, it has. Life has found a way. Yes. <laughs> so, to, to, that doesn't mean we shouldn't save what we can. Of course. So. Of course. I like how in Avatar, like in the, you've seen the extended version. Mm. Oh, there's a no. really, okay. There's a well, the beginning of an Avatar. The extended version, it's, it's on Earth. And shows like a little bit of his life on Earth, like him, him uh, protecting this one girl at a bar, which was pretty impressive because he's in a wheelchair. <laughs> like, Dang. but anyways, it shows this. He shows him watching one of those holographic TVs, whatever, and it showed that they had successfully managed to reclone to bring back tigers. Oh wow! So, like, and so it showed these footage of these tigers playing in like a reserve or something. And it was like, oh, it's kind of nice that you know they're trying to yeah get back kind of to where they were. They actually fix it a teeny bit. Yeah, teen- I mean, it's still pretty bad. Oh, yeah. Like, those those gas masks they have to wear on Pandora, they also kind of have to wear them on Earth sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so, so getting into Terra Nova territory. That's yeah, scary. so, anyways. Let's rate Arcu Indris. <laughs> when I was 65 million, I think for sure novelty factor it gets at least a 50 million, but, like... I'm going to give it a 52. Yeah, I think I'm going to give 52 as well. I'm trying to not do just multiples of 55 anymore. <laughs> but 52, 51 million, so. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's a really interesting, cool animal, and no one's heard of it. I know, like, everyone's like, oh, it's like, yeah, it's a or... So, if you're listening to this, write Disney a letter and get them to put it in a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, they, they put a Gigantopithecus in the live-action Jungle Book. <laughs> exactly. Just throw one of these in, I don't know, live-action Madagascar. That's not Disney, but... <laughs> They could put it in the crudes. They could put it in the crudes. Oh my god. T- I don't like the crudes. You talk about Volume 3 on I don't like the crudes. I actually haven't seen the crudes yet. Oh god, okay. okay. The problem I have with that movie is it has very, very few prehistoric animals in really? it. Really? It's mostly just made up, like, hybrids of creatures, like like owl uh, cats and, like, you know, so like two headed like, squirrel things. and like. So it's a, even more of a fantasy. Yeah, and I'm just like, and that's fine. Like, for what they're trying to do. Like, there are some. Like, there's a mammoth you see in the background that has, like, a giraffe pattern. There's, like, a saber toothed cat that has, like, macaw colors. Like, that's fine. More of that. Like, okay. you want to make it stylized. That's interesting. But most of the creatures are just, like, crocodile birds or, like, uh, this other sort of weird sort of fusions of modern animals. And I'm like, you had the opportunity to use prehistoric animals, and you deliberately chose not to take it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's strange that they did Like, that. come on. Like, I guess they're just trying to be creative? They are. No, again, for what they're going for, it's perfectly fine. That's just why I didn't like it. Okay, well, I'm I'll... suffering prehistoric animal withdrawal from that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see it and see what I think. Uh, the sequel has, like, a dog spider thing. It's like, <laughs> it's just weird. Like, hmm. I don't know. I don't like it. Well, whatever. <laughs> so... 
There is a sloth in that movie. That's why I think Ryan Reynolds is like a sloth that kind of hangs on him. Yeah, yeah. he's got the, the guy. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That. <laughs> Best part of the movie. <laughs> so, all right, well. That's it for this week. If you want to get a hold of the show, you can contact me at Matt D at Matthew Dollar Creator for any general questions to either co-host. You can follow me on social media at Matthew Dollar Creator on Facebook, at Matthew Dollar 64 on Twitter, and Matthew Dollar 64 on Instagram. Uh, in terms of what I've written, I have a book series on Amazon Megazoic available for print and Kindle. Dinosaur Sci-Fi, pew pew roar. <laughs> what have you, what do you guys plug, Stephen? Ah, uh, yes. So I, um... I am a writer myself. Yes. I have short fiction appearing or soon to appear in New Myths, The Fifth Die, uh, also poetry in Sci-Fi Quest. My novel at The Spark is available with Hereth Publishing. You can find that and more at my website. I don't... StephenCCurl.com. Yeah. So it's Stephen with a P-H and Curro, C-U-R-R-O. I don't know if I should just spell it out. As yeah, Stephen. yeah. And then there's also another C before the Curro because it's Stephen C. Curro. Yes. It's not Stephen C. Uro. As it's not Stephen Curro. It's Stephen, <laughs> it's Stephen C. Curro. Like if, I, if I tell people Stephen and I don't put the P-H, people are going to think it's a V. It's yeah. not a V, S- people. Well, let's, let's especially this little like your namesake, Stephen Curry. <laughs> like, it oh, goes by Stephen. So. You know, people, my student, I'm, I'm also an educator, by the way, for yeah. those who don't know. Um, I worked in middle school, and for like t- a year, kids kept calling me Steph Curry, and I had no idea they were talking about a basketball player. Like, that's how out of touch I am with the sports I get world. that. Well, I, I, <laughs> I didn't realize he was a basketball player until I watched Holy Moly on ABC, which is like, which is like uh, mini golf meets wipeout, and he's one of the people who hosts it because he's also an aficionado <laughs> for mini golf. That's funny. So, yeah, it's a fun show. <laughs> um, All right. But, yes, please look up my stuff. Look up Matt's stuff. Yes, yes. Good stuff. It's all good stuff. We all make arts. Like this show, this show is ours. I also have a podcast called The Rit Wits, where two twits talk about ritting. We're nearing the 200th episode. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> like, and I already got plans for where it's going to go. Uh, I'll tell you about them off air. But anyways, all right, well, that's it for this week. We'll see you at the end of every episode of Paleo Bites. Just, whoop, just, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, one slot there. That's good enough as any. <laughs> dun, dun, dun.